All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, and thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, tonight we'll be hosting the uh, January 2021 final project demonstrations. Um, so I'm Alice, I'm the head of coaching at Makers. Um, I've been at Makers for about three years, and I've had the pleasure of working with January 2021 for about three months now. Um, and it's really always uh, re um, really fun and a really proud moment for me to um, present those demos at the end of the course because three months ago, four months ago, uh, these developers you'll see tonight were writing their first few lines of code, they were writing their first test, they were really getting to grips with uh, what it means to be um, a developer. Um, and now you'll see every single team has built a, a really a full product that brings features um, uh, to the world and they've done that in whole new tech stacks that we haven't taught them, they've taught them themselves completely independently. Um, so uh, it's always a really proud moment, uh, but I'm also not surprised because we've been doing that for a number of years now. Um, and I've seen dozens of cohorts uh, go through makers like this and in a few months kind of pick up what they need to learn um, to, to be an independent developer who knows how to teach themselves what they don't know. Uh, Makers, you, you probably know, is a 16 weeks boot camp. We also have an apprenticeship um, and a part time course that we're offering right now. So uh, we have a few different products, but all of them are about getting you to a point where you can um, get a job, be job ready as a, as a developer. Um, so let me see. Oh, I know there's a lot of potential uh, students uh, maybe uh, in the uh, audience tonight. And if you are one, uh, you should know that after the presentations, we'll have five presentations tonight. After the presentation, there will be a QA. and a um, So stay after the presentation and we'll go through a few uh, questions about makers, the course, etc. cetera. Um, okay, that's me. So on to the presentations. Our first team tonight wants to motivate you to get things done, um, and they built a really sassy app to do that. Um, please welcome, um, clap on your uh, in your in front of your screen for a SAS task with Sasquatch. Thank, Thank you, you Alan. Alan, and welcome to Team SAS Task. Uh, do you have trouble staying on top of things while working from home? Do you yearn for the blissful hours you spent taking of, care of your Tamagotchi? Then Sasquatch is the app for you! Sasquatch is a sassy digital to-do list that links your productivity to the health of your very own Sasagotchi. Write a to-do list, mark a task as complete, and your Sasagotchi will grow and evolve, ultimately self-actualizing and letting you grow a new Sasagotchi. If you mark a task as incomplete, your Sasagotchi will regress and maybe even eventually die. For lots of sass, fun, and productivity, use Sasquatch. I'm now going to hand over to Joe, who is going to show a demo of our app. Thanks, Katie. So welcome to Sasquatch. This is our landing page. This is what you see when you first boot up the app. And this is our Sasagotchi. At the moment, just an egg that we're annoying by clicking on. Uh, he's not very happy about that. We can try and reset him at the moment and he's just asked why we would do that which is a pretty good question if you ask me anyway we can scroll across to our sas task this is our task list um, this is our list of everything we need to get done uh, before we do any of that we should add something new so do the demo day that'll be our task of the hour um, which ends up landing at the bottom of our task page the way tasks work is you can tick them off as complete or not complete by the yes or no buttons so let's tick this off as complete and go back across to our Satragotchi. Uh, and at this point, we can hit our evolve button. And look, our egg has grown, and it looks like it's getting ready to hatch. It still doesn't like it when we touch him, though. Uh, we also see a list, a number of the amount of complete tasks we have. Cool, let's uh, knock off another task. And again, we can evolve. And now we have our little baby Sasquatch. <laughs> cool, we're on a good roll. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go to bed early. Uh, back across again, let's go to the next stage and we have our fully grown snapping Sasquatch. 
Uh, for the purpose of the demo, we've shortened the life cycle. Usually there'd be a lot more steps, but otherwise we'd be here for 10 minutes or plus. Uh, so we've shortened it down. But at this point, we've completed all our tasks. Well, a lot of tasks. Uh, our Sasquatch has reached God level. And at that point, we can reset and try again with a new monster. But let's say today we're not feeling that productive. We haven't been outside. So we'll knock that one off. It's not done. Go across. Our Sasquatch is going to give us some negative, negative feedback and not be that happy. And it's not looking very healthy right now. Uh, but again, I didn't get to play that video game I really wanted to do today. And uh -oh, when I go back and click Evolve again, I've killed my Sasquatch, which makes me think, who is the real monster in this situation? But don't fear, at this point, again, you can reset and you get given a new egg and you can keep drawing again and hopefully do better on the second go around. I'll now pass over to Meg to talk us through our process. So we began our process with a team charter, which is where we discussed all together how we would work as a team we things like having constant communication between each other and to make sure we have fun throughout creating our app every two we would come together as a group to discuss the direction of our project and to assign everyone a new team role we would start every day with a group stand up which is where we would decide on who would work on what for the day and then we would end every day with a group retro where we would look back on what went well and what could have been improved I will now hand over to Mona for our challenges. Thanks, Bex. Um, yeah, so I think in spite of the uh, challenge of acquiring a new tech stack and learning a new framework, uh, there were probably two decisions uh, that challenged us the most that we took. The first one was to opt for a, a purely mobile app over a web application. We had become quite familiar with developing web applications uh, during the course. Um, but there were challenges in terms of developing the interface, also running the simulators that you, the mobile phone simulators that you need to run to test it. And then specifically also uh, moving our unit and integration tests onto a, a mobile platform. Those, those are quite challenging. And then the second area probably was uh, opting for a cloud database to store our, our tasks um, versus storing it on the device. Um, mostly surrounding the idea of writing to the database and then time delays to get the response back and refreshing in, uh, the interface. So, yeah, those were probably the biggest challenges we face. I'll, I'll quickly just chat through the technologies that we chose um, for our application. So we had been quite familiar, obviously, with JavaScript. So we chose React Native, which enabled us to do a native application that runs both on iOS and Android. So that was great. Um, we use a, a little framework called Expo on top of React Native, which kind of fast tracks the development um, onto, onto the, that platform. And it also allows you to run it on, a, on an actual device, quite simply. And then for the back end for our database, we chose a Google Firebase, uh, which is a really nice and light uh, database that uh, is pure. It's hosted online. And uh, Google, they also have things like storage and uh, user authentication. So it's a really good option for lightweight mobile apps. So yeah, uh, so despite those challenges, I'll, I'll hand over to Rich and he'll kind of share with you how we turn some of those into successes. Fantastic, thank you very much Mornay. Um, overall, over the past two weeks, we've had multiple successes and learned a lot, but so choosing one's quite difficult, but I would say our biggest success probably came from our biggest challenge, which was, as Mornay mentioned, React Native. React Native was a completely alien coding framework compared to everything else we've been taught on Makers Academy. Um, initially, there was a lot of difficulty understanding how navigating between pages on a mobile app worked and passing information between these pages as well. However, within a short space of time, we not only mastered a new framework, but were also able to create a fully functioning app on a mobile device, which we've also never done before. This has shown us that we are capable of coding anything, provided we follow the processes we've been taught. Furthermore, we had massive successes in our teamwork and our approach to um, our teamwork. Following an agile methodology with short two-day cycling of goals and tasks allowed us to quickly learn from our mistakes, adapt new strategies for our teamwork. This was incredibly useful when we realized our approach to adding a database in our main product was flawed and allowed us completely rethink and take a whole new approach. So you're probably thinking now, what's the future for SAS task? Well, next step, uh, next stage, we're hoping to publish the app. Following that, we're hoping to add deadlines to our tasks and hopefully make um, daily habits. After which we'd like to add more creatures, more little sasagotchis and additional sassy feedback. Final step after that will probably be adding user authentication so you can have your account on multiple different devices. 
Um, thank you very much overall for listening to our talk. Um, back to Alice, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Sask, for your Sasquatch presentation. Um, our second, our second team tonight, um, what they wanted to do with their app was support charity with their needs, um, as um, especially during this difficult time when charities uh, are looking for more people. So for our second team, please welcome uh, Donate. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, yeah, so we're team Donate, and we're made up of uh, Josh, uh, who unfortunately can't be here today, uh, uh, Oscar, Hugh, Sean, and myself. And uh, to simply put it, our app um, aims to bring people and charities together. Um, our ideas came from our personal experience working with, within charities and also trying to sign up to charities. Um, we figured that there was kind of two sides to the coin that in, in recent times and the recent pandemic that small scale organizations must, be, must find it quite hard to actually find volunteer work, workers. And then the other side is that, you know, as individuals who ourselves have tried to uh, work in various small charities that it's, it's quite hard to, to actually find them and uh, see the variety of, of good, well-worthy work that you can give. Uh, and I can pass on to Sean, who can tell you more about our MERN stat. So these are the technologies um, we use to create our app. Um, so MERN is probably a um, funny term to anybody who's not worked in technology, um, but how stacks work are their collection of different technologies that are used to put together things like these apps. So our database where we store information was on MongoDB. Uh, which is a cloud-based, so it, it's up in the ether. Uh, it then runs with a server of Express and Node.js. So uh, these are JavaScript um, languages. So they're the languages that um, the computer and everything interacts with. And finally, is something called React.js, which is the front end, makes it look nice, takes the language from the back end and makes it render and show you what the page looks like. So that's a MERN stack. Thanks, Sean. Um, we're now going to have a quick demo of how the app works. Um, so I'm just going to play this video. This, so this is a pre-recorded video. Um, this is on uh, an emulator phone. So it's kind of a fake phone that you can load up on your computer um, and see what the app looks like. Um, so as you can see, you've got a list of adverts there. Um, and as a charity, you can, you can register um, and type in some kind of key information. If you try to register without filling in all your details, it will uh, give you a warning. Um, so we've actually already set up a user, Highgate um, Oxfam, which I think Josh used to volunteer at, which is why I think we used it as the basis for quite a lot of this. Um, so this is uh, the login page. Again, you get a little warning if, um, if you can't log in properly. Um, and then we when you do log in, it takes you to your user page that shows you some of the information about the user. So an email address, username, phone number, and a real life address and the charity ID. Um, so then if you were to create a new advert, you would fill in this form. Um, it's pretty easy. Just click on the plus to get to this thing um, and it would appear on this page. Um, this page is where the list of all the ads are um, and you can search through them. If you want to, you can search by the charity name, you can search by the location, or you can search by the description. Um, and when you go on each individual advert, it will have um, a map embedded in it, um, which will show you where you are and how to get there by car. Um, and also there's a link to the website on there as well as the contact details that the charity created when they made the advert. Uh, and finally, when you finished uh, going, through the, um, going through the app as a charity, you can log out, um, which is pretty important if you can log in as well. Um, and next up, we've got Oscar to have a little bit of a talk about some of the things that we didn't find quite so easy uh, making this. Uh, thank you. So yeah, obviously our challenges. Uh, uh, the first one that we mentioned is uh, learning a new stack. Uh, so obviously we started coding around day two and we realized the implementation was not really correct. So we really did, really did it to re-implement obviously, uh, which is um, obviously a bit uh, annoying. Uh, secondly, we've got error messages as well. So we were using 
JavaScript and React. So that usually error messages are quite bad compared to other programming languages that we used. So it was harder to debug. Um, thirdly, we're using an emulator. So uh, an emulator is a fake mobile that you install on your laptop. Uh, so you can view your, your app that you're building. And we find it quite buggy. Uh, and we needed to reboot it a few times, uh, which can be a bit frustrating at time, I would say. And thirdly, so we implemented a map in our app. Um, we thought that it would be quite straightforward, but it ended up being one of the hardest features that we implemented. Um, so that was quite challenging to um, to Louis. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. And um, this is just a bit about our successes and kind of what went well um, and what we learned from it all. Um, in comparison to the rest of our tech stack, I think it's safe to speak for the rest of the team that MongoDB was um, was probably the easiest going part of it. I think in the two weeks, it only ever gave us one issue. Um, probably shouldn't be mentioning that, but in comparison to the rest of it, it was um, it was very, very reliable and um, quite easy to use. And things like when we came to repopulating our database and um, changing charity names, changing locations, changing kind of the the uh, more minute details. It was very user-friendly and uh, quite forgiving. Uh, another thing to mention is actually uh, what we learned is that, uh, how to kind of ask for help from others. Um, there were two avenues that we that I'd like to mention. One was the coaches, the coach channel. Um, should probably shout out Alex. He came to our rescue on two occasions when we were extremely stuck. Um, and he didn't just give us the answer. He kind of uh, provided thought-provoking questions that we were then able to help us figure out what was going wrong. Um, and the other avenue was our cohort. Um, I think there was one occasion uh, late into week two where uh, another team came into our Zoom chat and um, helped us with one of the features that they'd done. And, you know, that kind of speaks, speaks volumes that in a very intense and stressful situation that they were able to come and uh, lend a helping hand. Um, and yeah, and then the last thing we should mention is um, just really great teamwork. You know, I was really impressed with how everyone, like the hours everyone put in, I think most days we were working until past six, which was impressive. And, and even on the weekends, like the guys put in a proper shift. Uh, and yeah, it was just a lovely way to end this part of our, our Makers student course. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much, uh, Donate. Um, our third team tonight um, basically uh, wants to save the planet um, and will help you track your impact uh, with their app. Please welcome Smells Like Green Spirit with Spring Onion. Hello. Let me just wait it for load. We are Smells Like Green Spirit, and this is the production of Spring Onion, a carbon offsetting app. Um, our main objective was to make quite a simple app for the user in which they only need the license plate and the journey in kilometers or miles, and we would give them the carbon off the carbon emissions from that journey. And with that information, you can just go through a web, our chosen company carbon offsetter, and you could pay a small amount to give back to the environment. I'm gonna hand over to Tom so that he can go through a demo of this product. Thank you, Carsten. So when you open up our app, you are greeted with the home screen uh, where you're asked to enter your license plate number and the distance that you've traveled on this particular journey. Uh, on this first time, I've just put in a random license plate number, uh, which is, we get an error message saying this is not a valid license plate number. So then we put in a uh, license plate number that exists. We input our distance in kilometers or miles, and we click uh, calculate, which shows us our carbon emissions. We also have an equivalency, which puts those emissions into a greater context. And you can click to offset this carbon, which takes you to a link to our chosen uh, carbon offsetter, where the amount is pre-populated based on, on the journey. 
Going back to the home screen, we can now put in the license plate number of an electric vehicle, uh, fill in all the details of the, the journey length, click on calculate, and we get zero emissions, which is good. Uh, we also have a history page, which you can click on, uh, which shows a full list of journeys, as well as the total CO2 that you've emitted over these journeys. And you can also click to offset uh, the carbon emissions from that screen. Our About screen just has a bit more information on the app and the development team, uh, links to our GitHubs and the repository. And there's also a facts page where you can learn a little bit more about how to reduce carbon emissions in day-to-day -day life. Uh, so that's that's our app. I'll now pass you over to Jonathan to talk about the tech stack that we used. Cheers, Tom. Yeah, so technology we use to bring our concept to life. Um, at the heart of it is React Native, which is a really popular framework to build mobile apps. Um, I'm sure you come across the likes of Bloomberg and Instagram, which have all been built on uh, React Native. Um, so... The other key piece of technology we needed was access to um, a database whereby we could send it a license plate and then it would send us back information about a vehicle. And for that, we needed an API and we used the DBLA inquiries API. Um, Axios, which we'll see there next to the arrow, it's like a pipeline. So we can send messages to the API and it will uh, send information back to React Native. Uh, to switch screens, the engine behind that was React Navigation, um, quite, quite a simple plugin. And you'll see on the right hand side, we've got both Android and we've got the iPhone. So one of the key things about React Native is cross-platform. So you need a single code base to power both devices. Over on the left hand side, uh, we've got our database and this handled uh, all of our user journeys, so you saw on the front screen there, when you input your distance um, and your registration plate, that will all be stored there. So yeah, that is our uh, tech stack. Over to you, Miranda. So we actually didn't start out using React Native. At the beginning of the project, we all agreed that we wanted to make a mobile app, but we also all agreed that we wanted to learn the Python programming language. Well, we found out very quickly that you can't make mobile apps out of Python. So we switched over to React Native and it worked really well for us, especially using Expo. While Expo makes a lot of things very easy, it unfortunately turned out to make some of the things that we wanted to do impossible. So we did have to change our, our plans a little bit because of that. But the main challenge that we faced was accessing stored data, whether that was data that we had put in the secure storage or data from the DVLA. Essentially, uh, it takes a little while for that data to come back uh, into the app. So you can end up in situations where you're trying to use something that doesn't exist yet. So we spent quite a lot of time trying to get those things to work. Um, but I think Lucario is now going to talk about our successes. Yes, uh, so we're very happy that we have achieved what we set out to, to do. Um, as Carson said, we won an app you put your license plate and the distance and it calculates your carbon emissions and it gives you the opportunity to offset it. Um, we managed to get the app work on both iOS and Android. You can see the screenshot. We have that to prove it that it works on Android. Um, that was through Expo it helped us a lot. Um, yes, yeah, so we're going to the web via app. No need for browsers. Press the button. App. Web. Magic. Um, we're very happy that we created a nice and consistent design across all screens and we're very happy about our beautiful logo that looks like an onion and a car. And yes, as Miranda said, it was very difficult with the secure storage and we're very, very happy that we have managed to do it. So achievement. Back to you, Carson. So our next steps for maybe if we had a bit more time or what we will carry on to do for our app is to calculate the carbon emissions for different means of transport. So for example, a plane journey could now be taken into account. Um, also the functionality of allowing the user to put in multiple journeys rather than doing one at a time is quite tedious at the moment. And then finally some in-app purchases. So we don't need to use another site for it. We just all handle it within our app. Thank you very much for watching.
All right, thank you so much, Smells Like Green Spirit, uh, for presenting your app. Um, our next team um, and fourth team wants to support the local uh, market industry, um, which probably has, um, you know, as, as a lot of industries, um, seen quite a, a bit of a decline in the year. So they really want to support that and they built an app for it. Um, please welcome Mernie Sanders with the app Scrummy. Thanks, Alice. Hi, everyone. We're Mernie Sanders. So we started our two week project deciding what we wanted to create by brainstorming um, lots and lots of ideas. Um, and the one idea that we all agreed on or the one problem we all agreed on that needed solving was um, when we were trying to find a street food market to attend, we couldn't find all the relevant information in one place. So from that, Scrummy was born. So what is Scrummy and how does it solve this problem? So Scrummy is a street food market finder. It takes your current location and shows it on a map, centers you on a map and displays all the local markets in your area. Each market has a really detailed page which includes the opening hours, um, a map with the with a route with the shortest walking distance, um, description, images. If a user stumbles upon a market, they can use the add market feature. If a user has a market in mind, so say they want to um, go to Borough Market, but they're not sure whether it's open or not, they can use our search feature to find out that information. There's lots more features and the possibilities are endless. So you never have to spend a weekend street foodless or scrummyless again. So we have a quick demo of our app as seen on an iPhone. Uh, so when you open the app, you'll start with a nice home screen and it will show you all of the markets in your area with nice little avocados. You can click on each avocado to see uh, which market it is and see more information. We've got some pictures, a nice description, opening hours, a map of how to get there and how long it will take you, as well as their socials. If you suddenly stumble across a market, you may want to add it into the market yourself. Uh, so you can add your own market information uh, with a name and it will take your current location and add that into our uh, market database. So we've got crowdsourcing of information. Uh, that will then, once you've refreshed the app, show you um, the local market, as well as a nice little avocado of the market you just created. Um, what if you already know about your market and you know it's not in your area? You may want to uh, go and search. So we're going to type in Borough Market and go find out some information. I might want to pop down there tomorrow morning. Um, so let me go see if it's open. Uh, and off we go. So this is all of the markets we've currently got on there and our details uh, of all of our information. So in terms of uh, the planning and teamwork uh, over the project, um, we basically had big plans at the start of this uh, process. We wanted to kind of change the game of, of finding food markets. Um, as you can see for the pictures, um, we kind of the, did the kind of brainstorming and then picked out the ones that we felt were kind of achievable uh, and mostly kind of important and then went for those. Um, we then used Figma um, to basically and plan our screens and how it would look. So we had a clear idea of kind of what we were going towards uh, for the, uh, the end product. Um, we also used uh, Trello, so which is on the top right there, to basically plan our sprints. Um, so everyone was kind of assigned a role uh, in the team. And then at the end of every kind of sprint, which is every two days, we checked in, uh, or actually at the end of every day, we checked in to see how we, everyone was kind of feeling via a emoji or a suitable GIF which we loved. Uh, and then my personal favorite, because I pushed it on everyone, uh, a personal, sorry, not personal, a daily dance class every morning. As so you can see in the bottom right there, um, some questionable dance moves uh, from everyone. Um, and that was basically to kind of just boost morale really and get everyone moving. Um, and then we also kind of had a, um, like a, an hour after lunch every day where we had an optional time to basically kind of go in, kind of add some more uh, to our knowledge in terms of studying and stuff like that. So yeah. 
Um, so this is our MERN stack. We chose MongoDB as our database to store the market data as it was light, flexible, and easy to understand, considering we had a short amount of time and a lot of technologies to get used to. As MongoDB is a non-relational database, we used Mongoose so we could add a schema to make adding and extracting data more easy. And we used it with Express, React, and Node.js. Our app was best suited to being on mobile as we wanted it to be easy to use on the go and not have to be reached through a web browser. We used React Native as our front end as it builds native apps for iOS and Android. And we also used multiple map APIs for getting the user's current location, mapping routes, and displaying data. So our biggest issue was probably with stabbing in the dark versus self-led learning. None of us had experience building mobile apps or with React or React Native. So we found that we lacked clarity in how React Native actually worked and this was hindering our progress. We realized we were trying to impose Ruby on Rails convention onto React Native framework. So we found that taking more time away from the code to self-learn was just as important as writing code. Once we started to do this often and use self-learning earlier when we faced an error, we didn't understand, we actually overall started to make a lot more progress. And I'm going to pass on to Charlie to talk about the future for Scrummy. So looking back at the last two weeks, what we've uh, achieved, we thought we'd reflect on what we would do better if we did it again. Um, and in terms of our process, we thought that um, initially we sort of just went straight in and started building our app without sort of any knowledge about the actual React Native framework or anything like that. So we thought it better way to do it next time would be build a basic notes app so we can actually understand the technology and transfer that knowledge into what we want to make uh, which leads on to sort of less stabbing more asking for help earlier so more of actually learning what it is how we make it as opposed to just going straight in for it uh, also we need to restructure the code fo focusing on a parent child relationship for passing information so at the moment every component in our app makes a call to google's api for directions so we can get the time. Um, whereas if we were actually paying Google for that, that would obviously be very expensive if we had more than one user. Um, and also we didn't do much domain modeling, which led to quite a few problems in terms of uh, planning out our database. We didn't, uh, we struggled quite a bit later on with um, fetching the information because we hadn't named everything accordingly. So there's a little bit of confusion in that. And in terms of the product, what we do next time, we'd, um, add in a sign-in feature so that only certain people can update the information, whereas at the moment anyone who has access to the app can. Uh, we thought we'd have two different types of users, a market manager and then a public user. So the market managers would be in charge of their own page, whereas the public can add a market, which leads on to having ones that markets that are verified and unverified. So we could have a market manager could then verify the market definitely exists, um, so no one could be misled. And then also at the moment, our app pulls all the data from our database. So we have, it's a little bit slow in terms of its performance. So we'd like to be able to paginate our data so you can only search within your local area initially just to speed things up. And thank you very much. Um, thank you so much uh, for your presentation, uh, Mernie Sanders. Um, and so we're on to our last team. Um, our last team will basically get you out of that chair on which you spend the whole year if you're less me, like me. Um, and I think their app strikes a good balance between cuteness and cruelty. Um, you'll uh, see all of that with our next team called Sloth. Thank you very much. Hi everyone and uh, welcome to Sloth. So our app is built to make getting out of the house and stretching your legs fun. Uh, so Sloth is one of the seven deadly sins and in this case it's deadly for your sloths. You'll start with five sloths and a step target for the day and our app will track your steps by using the pedometer on your phone. If your daily target is reached, your snuggle of sloths grows. So a snuggle is what a group of sloths is called. And that's one of the fascinating facts that you might learn about sloths as you get to know your growing community. If you don't hit your target, a sloth will die. But don't worry, 
Sloths that have a negative disposition will remind you of their fate and try to guilt trip you into walking, while positive sloths will encourage you to keep hitting your step count. So I'll uh, pass you over to Ali now, who's got a demo of our app in progress. So this video shows us um, logging into the app for the first time. First things first, you get a welcome message, just welcoming you to the app. And then at the bottom on that signpost, uh, at the top, we've got steps. This is linked to the pedometer in your phone um, and it updates live so you can see your steps go up as you walk around. Uh, next, we have the target. This defaults to 5,000 um, uh, at first and then changes over time. The remaining steps until you hit your target and the number of sloths currently in your tree, which also defaults to five. Next to that, uh, we have our wise info sloth who can click. And this just gives you a bit of blurb about the app, um, lets you know how to, how to gain sloths and how you lose sloths. Next, if we scroll up our tree a bit, we can have a look at each of our slots. Um, you can click on the slots. Uh, this is the top one. Each sloth has a, a name, a personality, and a passion. Um, there's over 600 trillion different combinations, so we like to think we got it pretty close to making each sloth unique. Um, so if we look at the next sloth down, we'll see they have a different name, a different passion, a different personality and the third one. And you might have noticed those uh, red boxes appearing around the screen. Those are speech bubbles and they appear at random above each sloth and they uh, vary depending on the sloth's personality. This is quite a negative message and that's because this sloth uh, has a slightly more negative personality. So he's a bit more pessimistic. Now I'm gonna pass you over to Salah who's gonna show a video of the app at a slightly later stage after a few steps. Yeah, so when the user logs in the following day, they get a message uh, letting them know how they did the previous day, and it will let you know if you've killed a sloth or gained a sloth. You gain a sloth if you've uh, beat your target the previous day, and you kill a sloth if you don't hit your target. The, there's also a message to let you know it's, if it's game over, and that's when you've killed all your sloths off and the game resets. At the bottom here, you can see the target for this person is 6,500, and that's because it's, it increases based on the number of steps you did the previous day. So if you beat your steps the previous day, the steps for the next day increases by 100. And you can see here as well that um, there's a really big incentive to try and get as many sloths as you can, because every five sloths, there's a really special sloth that's created for you, and there's been special attention to the detail on these. So we think that this will be a really big incentive for people to try and hit their targets. Sorry, bear with. To build the app, we used React Native with Expo as the framework, which is great because it uses JavaScript as the base language. And it also allows us to develop for both iOS and Android. Um, to test these apps, we used Cypress for the front end and Jest for the back end testing. We used Inkscape to create all our SVGs, uh, which stands for Scalable Vector Graphics, and is good because they are really sharp images and aren't stored as pix pixels. Um, we use Zoom, and obviously this wouldn't have been possible without it, so I have to shout them out. Um, to manage our project, we used GitHub, uh, GitHub projects, which is basically GitHub's version of Trello boards. We extensively use their wikis for daily retro summaries, resources, uh, team charter, and it was all good because they, they all tied in very cleanly with the issues. Um, we use the Google Drive, or as I like to call it, the Slough Drive to store all our SVGs. Um, we faced several challenges trying to build the app. We knew we wanted a mobile app, on iOS mainly, uh, initially at least, but throughout this course we've, we've only been learning web technologies, so we were already in unknown territory. Um, after a bit of research, we learned that the main technologies we could use were Swift and React Native. We concluded that React Native was probably the best option as that was essentially JavaScript, which was a language we, we were all already a little familiar with. Uh, accessing the phone's pedometer was also a small obstacle we had to overcome. 
Uh, at first, I thought at first it looked as though HomeKit was the only option, but we learned that there are actually several APIs that do this. And, and in the end, we went with the Expose Pedometer SDK as that was a simplest solution. Uh, testing testing what was working as expected was also a bit tricky as the simulator couldn't access the step count. Uh, we can only get this on our phones. A database of some sort was also needed to ensure the data persisted. We didn't want to add a separate database just for the sole population on the devices. That felt a little overkill for our needs. So we used a, a package called Secure Store that ensured the slot count could persist on that device. Uh, SVGs were also tricky to have in our app as that wasn't supported natively in our in, in React Native. Uh, and you couldn't just insert them like you could with other image formats. So we had to use another library that could read the file mark markup after having to convert it to a JSX-like syntax in a functional component. Uh, decisions were also hard to come by as there were so many features we wanted to implement, but of course we knew we only had two weeks to implement this. Uh, Dan will tell us a bit more about some of the functionality we would have liked to have implemented if given a bit more time. Thanks, Rachel. Um, So hopefully you'll agree that the sky's the limit for sloth. Um, and so we wanted to share a couple of the features that we had in mind that we'd, we'd like to progress it with. Um, I'm not going to go through all the ones on the slide, but wanted to highlight just a couple. Uh, so firstly, we, we'd really love to have players compare their sloths and trees with friends via a leaderboard si type system. Um, we'd love to, to kind of have a history of fallen sloths for when, the, when you don't uh, hit your step count and you lose loss to really ramp up that guilt to make sure you're getting out there on the streets and walking. Um, we'd like to add some animations to our sloths as well as some some push notifications to encourage users back to the app uh, if they've maybe not been on it for a couple of days. Um, and last but not least, we, we'd always like to add more sloths. And that's it from us. So thanks very much for listening. All right, thank you so much, uh, Sloth team. That was that was really great. Um, and also thank you to all the teams uh, from January 2021 tonight. Uh, I'm really, really proud of what you achieved. Um, and it's always great to see your ideas come from, you know, an idea to something that actually people can use. So congrats on your project, congrats to finishing the course. And yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the ne next part of this will be our Q and A, uh, and maybe I'll hand over to you, Haley. I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Alice. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, thanks to the cohort for your presentations. Um, it's always really nice to see the kind of like end result of the course and you know how how far everyone comes. So uh, congratulations. Um, I hope you all go off and have a bit of a Zoom celebration together now. Um, so yeah, enjoy your evening. Um, so if um, you're still online with us and you want to know a little bit about um, potentially joining makers and uh, more about the course, then um, for the next kind of 30 minutes or so, um, myself, Alice, and also Joe, who's part of our course managers team, uh, will be taking some questions from you all. Uh, to see, you know, if we can kind of help guide your decision a little bit. Um, so if you've got a question, um, please just drop it into the Q&A panel um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go through them and see if we can help. Um, just to get things started, I guess, Joe, would you be able to give us a rundown of uh, which cohorts are open at the moment um, for part-time and the full-time course, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so at the moment, we've got one kicking off on Monday. So I'll ignore that one for now. <laughs> but uh, we run them every four weeks. So the one after that is going to be on April the 26th, and the following May the 24th, and June the 21st. We also have a part time course in the pipeline as well. And then that's for April the 25th. So there's two quite close together there the full time and the part time. Um, full part time courses start on Sundays. We have a big session on there. So that's why it's um, it's on that date. Cool, awesome, lovely stuff. Um, so I guess um, just to kind of get things started, obviously um, we're getting kind of a lot of people joining our events at the moment who are maybe only just kind of thinking of learning to code um, since COVID and maybe looking uh, to, to change jobs or like upskill. Um, as people, you know, just give people a bit of a chance to um, type in their questions. 
could you maybe share some of the resources that we recommend to people to to get started like before they apply yeah yeah so you can be a complete beginner and come to us or you can have a bit of experience in some other languages and some other things as well um, but when you come to us we'll get you started on a language called ruby um, for lots of reasons but it's a great one to start on and the best one of the best ways to get to know what it can do and learn the syntax is by using a website called code academy which i'm sure a lot of you will have heard of already and there's a basic course on there that's free to use and um, it's about it's about 15 hours long uh, they'll keep prompting you for the pro version but ignore that for now for what's needed um the basic version is is, is brilliant um so you want to work your work your way through there working your way up to a second website called code wars and this website is all challenge based and so you're going to be putting what you've learned into practice so it's a bit more practical um which makes it a bit more fun but a bit harder um so when you get to that stage don't be afraid to Google things, look for a different perspective of someone else explaining it, maybe through YouTube, or if you're finding a particular topic, maybe not sinking in as much, um, have a little research around that topic as well. That will actually become quite a useful skill later on. Um, so it's not cheating, but try and avoid looking at the solution buttons and always sort of use Google first if you can. Awesome, thanks Joe. Um, looks like that's kind of, answered our first couple of questions uh, from the Q&A. So um, yeah, hopefully we've answered those for you, but send us a follow up if there's anything else you wanna know. Um, cool, I'm just gonna find the next one. Um, so Alice, could you um, let us know uh, which languages uh, are focused on during the course, please? Yes, um, absolutely. So we cover two uh, main languages on the course. Um, all the devs start with Ruby, um, and uh, Ruby is, a, is a, it's just a really good beginner language. Uh, it's a language with a great community. It's quite simple to start with. There's a lot of really good resources out there to start on it. Um, and then at the six weeks mark of the main course, um, we do a little bit of JavaScript and you'll see uh, all the teams you've seen tonight were actually using JavaScript in their final project. Um, so. JavaScript is a bit of a necessary language if you're going to do any kind of web app, and it's also quite a popular language. But we don't start with it because I think it can get a bit confusing for beginners. And also, doing two languages really gives us, um, as, a, as a programmer, knowing two languages, it really starts you up on um, understanding the common programming principles that are important for all languages. So having two languages will really help you pick up a third language. And in fact, we often see uh, people get jobs in um, any kind of uh, language after the course and, and pick them up pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, Ruby and JavaScript. Cool, thank you. Um, and then the second half of that question was asking um, if we have a part-time course in August. Um, we don't at the moment. Uh, currently the part-time course is, the only one planned is the one that, um, that Joe mentioned. Um, do you know what the kind of plans are for, for any future ones at the moment, Joe? Yeah, so kind of based on what we did before with the with the, the pilot and then moving on to this first one we run, it's about sort of 10 months in between them. So potentially towards the, the end of the year, maybe around November time, um, we might plan another one, but um, we'll probably start announcing that, uh, I think, at least four to five months ahead of, ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, although there's nothing planned yet, perhaps around the end of summer, you might hear an announcement that we might be doing one at the end of the year. Cool, thank you. Uh, lovely. So the next question is asking, um, is it possible to start the bootcamp as full time and then after a, a two months transfer to the part time course? Um, it's not actually a question that we've had before, but considering um, the different paces of the course, um, I wouldn't think it'd be possible to do that. Um, obviously, the, the, the full time main bootcamp um, the main on site section is only but well, we say on site, but the the main kind of like uh, 12 weeks up after the pre-course um, is only 12 weeks. So the timings would kind of like fall, fall out of line with, um, with part-time, which is kind of held across seven months. Um, so it just wouldn't be possible to, to connect the two. Um, cool. So uh, Lucas is asking, uh, from what they've read about makers, um, we have a good network with potential uh, employers and has this changed during COVID? 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure kind of employment is a big thing that, you know, everyone's been wanting to kind of find out about at the moment. Um, n none of us, particularly from the hiring teams, but I guess like from what we've seen, obviously um, COVID definitely had an effect on it um, in terms of like hiring rate when it kind of first kicked in. I think everyone, you know, every kind of industry had that initial kind of like, okay, what's going on? Um, so it took a little while to adjust. Um, we've definitely seen hiring pick back up again. Um, it is still taking longer to get a job than it did before. Um, but it is definitely picking up. Um, in terms of our actual network of employers, um, so we have kind of pre-existing relationships. So um, there are certain companies who will come back and, you know, to hire from us again and again. Um, and, you know, th those relationships still exist. So even though some of them, you know, might have kind of paused their hiring while <laughs> everyone figures, you know, what on earth is going on. Um, they they are still kind of like connected to, to makers so i imagine that you know we've seen some of them come back to hire and hopefully um more of them will be following suit shortly awesome uh cool so uh, could we share any information about the interview process um cool yeah joe uh, could you jump on that one yeah so for the interview process um those resources that I mentioned to you before, you're aiming towards this um, sort of coding assessment. You might hear the name pairing session being listed on some of the blogs if you've been reading those. Um, it kind of has this pairing element to it. And so it's essentially five little coding challenges done in Ruby. And the first two are kind of more theory based. There'll be stuff in there that you'll need to have gained through the Code Academy bit. And then the rest will be more in that sort of problem solving process and you'll get that those skills from working on the code war stuff um but it's it's a fairly relaxed session you can still use uh, google if you wanted to um to research some bits um it, because that's still part of the problem solving process um it's less about having a memorizing possibilities mindset and a lot more about having a how does this work mindset so it might be in a, a new format to what you've seen before, but it's just taking a step back and then having a think, how does this work? Um, the admissions manager's there, if you, if you can't quite understand what the question's asking you, and they'll help you sort of get you back on track. But it's a, it's a space to show us what you've been preparing. In, in a way, the main challenges and what, why we do this is partly to see if you like coding and to, to see how, how you find it. And in the process, maybe you've come to one of our workshops in the meantime where you can meet some of our coaches and meet some of the other learners. And so it, it, it's all it's all preparing you for the course and less of a, an interview. We won't be asking you technical questions or looking at your previous experience. It's a lot more. Is this person ready? Is this person really keen? Cool. Well, let's get them get them ready and get them on. Because if, if, you, if you weren't successful on that first attempt, we'd give you lots of feedback and you'd be able to book in a second attempt um, after a couple of weeks. Cool, thank you, Joe. I'm very comprehensive. Um, cool. So the next one from Jack is asking: um, uh, Is the course uh, fully remote going forward, even post COVID uh, 2022? Um, no, is the immediate answer. Like I think um, we're staying remote for the foreseeable, but um, there are you know plans to do some kind of on-site offering when the time is right. Um, in general, like we've been kind of erring on the side of caution with 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 the whole handling of, of um, the pandemic. Um, so like like we locked down early, and I th I think even though there's now announcements for restrictions lifting, um, we're kind of going to you know pace it, judge on what we think is best. Um, obviously, we have like lots of students and and lots of staff, and um, the the remote offering luckily for us is the same as as um what we we're offering on site so um yeah so you know and until it like we know it's like totally safe to go back then we'll stay remote so all of the cohorts that you see um listed on like on the apply page um all of those will be um fully remote and it's not like it will kind of switch halfway through to then suddenly be on site as well um if you want to get updates about it our newsletter is probably the best place um, to keep updated. 
Um, and also we've got a blog um, on our medium that has like our general kind of like rolling COVID-y updates. But yeah, hopefully we'll be back on site uh, at some point soon. Cool. Um, so Ben is asking, uh, is the majority of our hiring support um, London focused or are we able to support graduates to find roles UK wide? Um, yeah, so the, the vast majority is, is London based. Um, I think from historically, you know, being based in London and that's where we previ previously just operated out of. Um, over the past year, it has expanded a little bit. Um, I think we've got, you know, a couple of hiring partners. Um, I'm right in saying Cambridge, Joe, and possibly Bristol. Um, but yeah, definitely the vast majority is London. Um, obviously, it depends on if there are, you know, a lot of roles becoming remote now. But yeah, in terms of our main connections, they're all London based. Um, I suppose just to add on to that one, um, in terms of the hiring support, there's kind of two teams involved and so one of them is the partnerships team which Haley is talking about there and the roles that they'll be putting in front of you but not everyone gets hired through those and the majority get hired through jobs that they found themselves or through the support of our career support team and so wherever you're based you'll be able to use our career support team and we've got career coaches in there who will help you with the whole post maker's life of um, of career coaching getting those uh, CVs um, sort of tight knit and your portfolio, where to apply for jobs, how to handle that interview process, preparing for that tech test, all of that type of thing, you'll be able to use that until you've got a job. So um, yeah, wherever you're based, we'll, we'll, we'll still support you. Cool, yeah, thanks for adding that because I think that is such a huge part of it. Um, so yeah, it's definitely important to kind of like recognize those, uh, both sides of it. Uh, lovely stuff. So um, May is asking, um, this one's probably for you, Alice. Um, some of the teams mentioned about um, doing some self-learning prior to making uh, their apps. How much self-learning is expected in, additional, um, in addition to the prescribed course material? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question because in fact, um, our course is a lot about self-learning and um, I would say that the, the, the material, um, the, the pre-course is very material focused. And then in the first few weeks, there's still quite a, a lot of material, but it kind of decreases. And the idea is that you're, you're transitioning from learning through, um, you know, a, a prescribed curriculum to learning through the resources you can find by yourself, your experience, setting projects, asking questions. And in fact, that's a, a really important transition for us because when you're a developer on the job, you are still expected to learn. In fact, when you become a developer, you're, you're not just learning for four months during the bootcamp, you're learning for all of your life. Technology changes all the time. And as a developer, you're not so much expected to know everything before you get the job, but you're very much expected to learn on the job and to be able to tackle problems in a new technology or using new tools that just came out. Um, so you need to really uh, practice that skill of finding the right resources for you, going through them, know what will work, what will not work, asking questions. And so in fact, there's a lot of self-learning throughout the course and the course relies heavily on it. And so when the teams talked about self-learning here, what they meant was not so much um, that the rest of the time they were following material. In fact, for the full final projects, they're not following materials at all. They set their own projects, they set their own goals, and they decide their own tech stack. Like we have zero material, zero in the course about building React Native apps. And, and I see that as a good thing. They, they, they managed to find all of that on their own. And that means to me that they're ready to um, Kind of get on to their life as a developer and manage to work with new technologies without needing a course. Um, so yeah, a lot of self-learning in the course. And I know sometimes, I mean, there's a hidden question here maybe that sometimes people ask, and I think it's, it's important to be quite explicit about it. Um, when you're paying for makers, it's not just that you're, you're paying for material. In fact, materials in the tech space, in the tech industry, um, you can find for free online. Um, you, there's plenty of things that you can learn for free online. But a lot of the time, the obstacles that you have when you're trying to just learn to code for free online 
is around motivation, is around having a network, is around having the right people to guide you towards uh, what, like, what steps to take, what direction to take, to unblock you and ask specific questions. Um, and so this is what we're providing as a makers. We're providing an environment, we're providing uh, coaches who are all experienced software developers, um, but it's not really much about the material that we provide. We definitely have some material, uh, but as I said, it's, it becomes less and less important in, in our learning. And that's, I think that's something important to know about the course because um, yeah, if you, if you expect to pay for like super, uh, uh, complete and detailed material that uh, you can find nowhere else. That's that's not what we're about. Cool, thanks, Alice. Like, I, I think it was really nice to hear that distinction. So I think, especially like when you're for, at the first stage of, you know, learning to code, you, you hear self-led learning, it might sound a little bit like, like unstructured learning or like that you're completely left on your own. And I think like, that's the whole point is it's about kind of like providing like the scaffolding, but like sort of like what happens in between is, you know, it's up to the student to like explore those things. Um, yeah, uh, we have some great other resources about um, some of the coaches uh, explaining self-led learning. And um, if I can find them during this event, I'll try to, to drop them in the chat as and when, um, otherwise I'll drop it in the follow-up email to everyone. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Um, Lovely. So um, the next question from Will is asking, um, sorry, from William, uh, is asking um, da, 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 da. what percentage of students uh, go on to successfully obtain employment uh, in development, especially in pre-COVID times? Um, and do, uh, do we keep in touch and maintain a social network with ex-students now in jobs? This is a great question. Um, and <laughs> there's a lot to cover in it. Um, so yeah, uh, you kind of stipulated their pre-COVID times, which I think is like super important to understand. I think um, when we last uh, measured the numbers before COVID, um, it was 89% of students who were looking to find a software development job um, had obtained a software development job since leaving Makers uh, since in six months, six months since leaving Makers. I'm sorry if I completely waffled that. Please ask me if you want me to, to repeat it. But um, but yeah, that was before COVID, which is, I really, really want to stress that. Um, it has definitely, like I said, like COVID has definitely affected how long it takes to get a job. So I wouldn't um, want people to think that that's representative of now. Um, like I said, things are improving, um, but people are like starting to find jobs more around the six month point at the moment. Um, I don't think we have like a current specific number on it um but if you do want more information like please, please just like email us and i'll see if i can get a, something a bit more specific for like um like the current time period if that's helpful for you um the next part was asking about the the network for our students which i'm really happy that you asked because um it's a huge part of what we do um so i saw another question further down that's asking about like what makes makers different from other boot camps and our network is one of well i mean i can't speak for them but i can speak for our network and i know that it is a really really strong part of our, our offering um so we put loads and loads of effort into um making sure that once you finish the course um you're still part of makers community so we run um an ongoing series of events for our alumni um to help them in all sorts of different things like um there'll be kind of upskilling workshops like in the before time when we were allowed to see people in person uh, we would have you know in-person events talks uh, dinners all that kind of thing um there's also lots of opportunities for like um peer-to-peer -peer mentoring um and also lots of people find their kind of first second third roles out of makers through that community um we were kind of established eight years ago now. So lots of people who have been through makers and are now in more senior positions or like they know that there's like junior positions going at their company, they'll kind of come to our community uh, to share them because they know what people have learned and the experience and that kind of thing. So it's such a massive asset and it's also like a really fun space and a really like um, inclusive knowledge sharing space. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say it's, 
it's it, it's just such a, like a, a special like makers -y thing to be to be part of um anyone got anything else to add on that before i move on to the next question yeah i mean you, you said most of it i think our alumni community is amazing um and uh, i mean the alumni community is not just alumni in in their corner right like we're always learning from them we're always in contact um we have this thing that pairs you randomly with someone else from the community and i know there's a bunch of staff on it but also our ceo is on it so so alumni sometime like get to have coffee with our ceo just to have a chat um and i think um yeah i think it's a really uh, special place that really like makers is not this four months course it's this community that is with you for life so i think it's actually a really huge part yeah yeah completely agree it's definitely not talked about enough um and i'll just say if, if you're thinking about doing the course and you kind of want to speak to somebody who's done the course speak to one of these alumni um reach out on linkedin um they'll be you'll be surprised about how sort of ready readily available they are to sort of chat about their experience um, because people help them and it's kind of created this cycle of people who are, are willing to chat about their experience and, and help people through um, so yeah i'd recommend doing that cool thanks guys um also just a heads up that obviously we're sharing like lots of information today um i'm recording this and like we'll pop it on youtube like at some point um next week so if you want to kind of like listen back then all the information will be there as well um cool uh the next question hopefully was answered in our last one so i'm just gonna move past that for now um cool so nicole's asking um what type duh, 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 what type of uh sorry i've got a complete black brain blank uh what type of jobs are people getting after the program cool um, they're particularly interested in front-end development um a, a big range to be honest like all kind of uh the, the course equips you to be a software developer but we get people going into front end back end uh some go into ios development um i don't know alice from from your experience like are there any kind of different uh roles that you see people wanting to go into is it or is it still uh, i mean people want to go into a number of roles um i think um i looked at the alumni survey recently i think most people after makers are on a full stack role a developer role but there's definitely a, a good healthy portion of uh, front end back end and then some devops uh, testing other software related jobs um so there's definitely a range um we prepare people for full stack which is both front end and back end um but we also do a lot of testing and we do a little bit of devops um so i think it's quite a complete course and then you would probably, if you're very, like if you're interested about a really specific area, after the course, you would spend a little bit more time just digging more into that area, learning more um, on your own in that area. And that's where software learning really helps. Um, uh, but yeah, you could absolutely get a job in a, a lot of um, related, like a, a lot of uh, things related to software engineering. Cool, thanks, Alice. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Cole. Um, Lovely, so I'm gonna to try to answer uh, just the questions that we have left in the, the Q&A um, at the moment. So thanks everyone for uh, submitting them. And if you have any additional ones, um, you can always, like I say, email me back from the follow-up and I'll try to get the right answers to you. Uh, cool, so Killian is asking, how long does it typically, typically take um, from initial application to starting the course? And is it possible to apply now and then join in around six months time, uh, Joe? Be better uh, yeah so it's actually a, a lot shorter so you could do that and that would be brilliant and, and would um you'd be uh, nice and early if you were going to do that but it doesn't have to be that long as well um we say to sort of submit your application at least um sort of five to six weeks before the start date that you want to choose so as i said before we run them every four weeks um it depends how new you are to coding if you're brand new, I'd, I'd definitely recommend that sort of six week mark. It can be a little bit quicker if you're um, a bit more familiar and experienced with coding. Um, the, the Code Academy course can take about sort of 15 hours and then it's hard, it's, it's sort of like an average, it's quite hard to say, but for the Code Wars prep, that could take about three weeks. And I, you, you wanna try and come to one of the workshops as well. Um, we run those two, two times a, a month. 
Um, so yeah, you just want to give yourself that kind of nice buffer buffer time. Once you've passed your pairing session interview with us, we'll send you a welcome pack and there'll be a few little bits in there as well that you can prepare for the start of the course. And you want to give that buffer of if you weren't successful that first time, that you'd have that second attempt, which you'd need about 10 days buffer time for that. So all in all, uh, go for about six weeks and then you'll be uh, safe and sound. Cool, thank you, Joe. Um, lovely. So Jay's asking, uh, what's the best way to keep track uh, for apprenticeships? I'm gonna ask you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the best way to keep track is on our apprenticeship page on our website. So if you type in makers apprenticeships, I'll post it in the chat after this and it will take you to our page and it will say to register your interest. Um, and you, you can sort of submit your, your email there and then you'll be in the loop for, for when we have uh, apprenticeship opportunities that will come through. Cool, great stuff. Um, lovely. So um, next question is asking, um, are tech companies sponsoring women? Um, so this is maybe in relation to the, to the uh, scholarship that we're running at the moment. Um, please let me know if I've understood that wrong. Um, so some of you might know that we're offering uh, 12 uh, scholarship places onto our course this year. Um, we've partnered with an organization called Codebar and another organization called Coding Black Females. Um, and if you join those communities as a member, um, you can apply for the scholarship. Um, so it's not sponsored by tech companies. Um, those are positions that, that Makers is just offering for members of those groups. Um, and if you'd like uh, kind of further details on those, I'll drop the link um, to the to the scholarships page uh, just in the chat so you can find out if you're eligible. Um, like I said, if that wasn't the question that you're asking, please let me know and I'll answer the, the right one for you. Uh, cool. So Fawn is asking, uh, do we also teach Python because um, it's very useful? Um, so Alice touched on that we teach uh, Ruby and JavaScript. Uh, could you maybe let us know, like, um, you know, can students use Python? Like why we don't teach it or that kind of thing? Yeah, um, so we don't uh, we don't teach Python, um, but I've definitely seen a number of final projects in the past where uh, developers have used Python, which shows that it's quite um, like it's quite easy to pick up a third language after Ruby and JavaScript. And I think especially for Python, um, Python is quite close to Ruby. It's not exactly there. I mean, in some other ways, it's close to JavaScript. In fact, most programming languages really are kind of related. And I would say Python is quite an easy um, thing to learn after Ruby and JavaScript. So we don't teach it. Um, we definitely have coaches who know Python and would be very happy if you're if you take on the course and you decide to learn uh, some Python on the side and you want a coach to give you a review on your code or to give you advice. We definitely have coaches who would be able to do that, um, but that would be something that you you do in your own self-directed uh, learning time. Uh, oh, and is it very useful? I mean, <laughs> this is a hard question to answer. Um, all in terms of, uh, can you do a lot of things with Python? In fact, you can do kind of the same thing, which is everything with all programming languages. But I, I, I accept this is a very high level theoretical answer. Um, I think Python is quite popular in some industries, um, especially in the data science industry or in some parts of the finance industry, but it's definitely, um, um, so, so it can be useful to know Python to work there, but at the same time, Companies that use Python will definitely hire people who know other languages, knowing full well that a developer who knows an, a few languages will be able to pick up a new language. So in fact, once you're a, a more experienced developer, it, it typically doesn't matter which language you know, because companies expect from a developer they can just pick up a new language quickly. Cool, well, thanks, Alice. Um... Awesome. So the next question is asking, um, uh, they're dyslexic and have we had any dyslexic students previously um, and what would happen if they struggled on the course? Um, yeah, no, thanks for asking this. Um, it's, uh, we've definitely had dys uh, dyslexic students before. We've had um, over kind of 2000 students graduate now. So we've had like, you know, various 
um, various different questions around this. Um, we would always do our best to, to kind of like accommodate whatever your learning needs are. Um, and our coaches are really, really good with kind of sitting down with people and seeing, you know, how can we help you best? Um, and it's something that if you chat to us during um, your application process, we'd make sure to kind of connect you with the right people from our team uh, before you started makers just to make sure that um, we're kind of like fully equipped to support you um, and the next part was what if you struggled with the pace um, so everything is kind of uh, on a one-to-one -one basis so obviously there's the support from coaches um, Alice sorry did you want to add something Alice oh sorry you're muted I was going to say I can take that if you want um, yeah, go for it. um um, I mean, yeah, as, as Haley said, we've had dyslexic students before. Um, um, and but what what would happen if you struggle struggle on the course is pretty much the same as would happen with anyone who may struggle on the course. Um, um, I think there's two things that are important. The first one is it's important to know that the pre course is the first four weeks, and in some ways. If you if during the pre course you feel really overwhelmed and you realize well actually I can't go on to the main course it's always like you could potentially kind of you know drop off from there and not continue on to the main course but if you were on the main course um, as Haley said I would um, you know a coach would have one to ones uh, with you and assess your needs um, see what's the best strategy sorry for you into towards your goals. Um, and help you there. I think what's really interesting about makers is because we support, like the course itself is 16 weeks, but we support devs until they get a job. Um, and, and that means that if you if you still need a bit more time at the end of the course to you know work on some projects and you want to chat with a course, it's still uh, chat with a coach after the course has ended, it's still very much possible. You would not be like, with your cohort with like a structured week and goals for the week, but you would still be able to work on uh, all of our course material and have chats with coaches regularly. So it's uh, like once you're in, we're, we're here to support you. Um, yeah. Cool, thanks Alice. Um, yeah, hopefully that's helpful. Um, lovely. And then Alex is asking, um, they joined like, uh, are we planning to stay remote? They live in Edinburgh, but love the whole Makers ethos. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're definitely gonna um, keep up um, a remote element element for the foreseeable future. Um, we touched on it earlier, but um, every all the cohorts that we're advertising at the moment will be fully remote, and I think you know several after that will continue to be remote. Um, I doubt when we do go on site that it will be like an immediate everyone bang on site um so yeah if, if you're looking to apply then it's definitely something that's going to be available um for you know a, a significant amount of months still uh great stuff um i'm not entirely too clear of the next two questions um if you want to send like a, a clarification that'd be really handy but i'm just going to clear these ones for now um and i'm going to ask Answer the last one from uh, Philip asking, uh, how many solo projects are there and how many group projects are, are there? Um, and for group projects, uh, how will hiring managers know your con contribution to the code? That's a really good question. Um, could you help that, us? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so during the weeks, actually, you're not really working on solo projects. You would, okay. No, sorry. So during the first part of the course, the first half of the course, during the week, you would work on exercises and then you would work on challenges pairing with someone different every day. So these are not really solo, they're pairing challenges. But then at the end of each week, you would be sent an end of week challenge that typically people um, uh, complete uh, over the weekend. And these ones are completely solo and they're, they're here to help you validate that you got the learning from that week. Um, but also I think it's important to know that the type of challenges you'll get uh, you know, at, in, in the first week are not really important to get hired. You learn so much for the course that really it's not, you know, it's not that that will get you hired. Um, now the second part of the course is mostly team projects. So there in total, we have three team projects, actually four now, because the second week of JavaScript is now a, a team uh, week. So we have four 
uh, projects that you build in teams. And the last one, you fully decide what you build, whereas the other team projects, we give you a, a, like a quite a specific, um, um, you know, a goal for what you build. Um, there's also a week in week 10 where you work solo on like the typical tech test task or typical task that an employer would send you and where you really focus on having best quality code. Um, so typically when people uh, choose projects for the portfolio, I, I encourage them to look at, you know, the final project, maybe one thing they developed in tech test team, and then maybe one pet project they pick up after the course ends. Um, but then in terms of knowing what is your contribution to the code, developers use this tool, um, like developers use tools uh, called version control tools. And so for example, at Makers, we use Git uh, and GitHub. And that's something that tracks every change to the code and who made it. So it's in fact really, really easy to know uh, who wrote a piece of code in any project um, because that th there's basically a tool that tracks every single change to the code. Um, and, and so it's not, it's not so much a problem to kind of show what is your contribution to a group project. Lovely, thanks, Alice. Um, there's a last one that, that snuck in that we can answer uh, quickly, but I'm just conscious of, of keeping everyone for too long. Um, uh, it says that you can't take holiday during the course. Um, no, we, we don't advise it. It's just better for your learning um, to, to stay on the main um, trajectory trajectory that we need to plan um, and they're asking if it's possible to make up um, a session in your own time or another day. Alice what's your kind of advice for that? Yeah it says this is a part-time course question and I think for part-time it's slightly different um, so I know there's at least one um, week of half term uh, that is um, a scheduled at for a part-time course and uh, there could be potentially a few more things are arranged um, and um, also, so, so that's for part-time. Um, also, if you're really like, both for part-time and for full-time course, you should, you should not book holidays. You should, be, you should be here while the course is running. Um, but if you do have to miss because you're unwell or you, know, you have some unforeseen events that just comes in, obviously we're not, you're not, we're not forcing you uh, to be there. And because there's a lot of self-led learning in the course, um, you can you can have a chat with a coach to see how to catch up. It's just that you should be really committed to the course and committed to putting in those hours. Um, and so, yeah, the, the full time course is full time, uh, very much so. The part time, some organized uh, uh, time off. Um, is that is that is that in like on par with what you're thinking, Joe, for part time? Yeah, yeah. So, and for part time, there's sort of four to eight hours of um, uh, independent study that you do, as well as the the schedule. So, like Alice said, there it would be a case of sort of speaking to your coach beforehand and say, saying, um, "Is there something I could do in those four to eight hours um, to sort of catch up or or to pre prepare?" Um, and that half term date is at the end of August into September, and so it covers that August bank holiday as well. Cool. Lovely, great stuff. Hopefully that's um, given you uh, a good answer to your question. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we always really appreciate your questions. It's good to kind of understand like, you know, what you guys want to find out so we can hopefully make some content around it and like make it as easy as possible for you to kind of um, make your decisions. Um, Joe's dropped his email in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to reach out. Um, my email is also just hayley at makers.tech, same format, um, same for all of us. So let us know if you've got any other questions. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna let you go. Go and enjoy your lockdown Fridays um, and hopefully we'll see you again really soon. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Hayley. Bye.